Well, good morning, everybody. My name is David Morgan. I'm the environmental planner for the town of Arlington. I am happy to welcome you here to our culminating sustainable landscape series. We were given a grant by MAPC, which is the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, under their climate, accelerating climate resilience grant program in order to accomplish this program. And the purpose of the grant was to host these three uh, workshops. We did one in Stoneham, one in Winchester, and now one in Arlington. And we are taking the handbook that was developed by the town of Concord uh, on how to do sustainable landscaping in a residential setting primarily and adapt that to be used in each of the towns on the grant. So you can look for that next. And I want to thank my colleagues, Ken Pruitt and Aaron Wartman of uh, Stone Winchester and Stoneham, respectively. And they are the ones that have been collaborating on this project, so it will be about today. Um, we've also been working with Kim Lundgren Associates, who put together the first handbook, and we've been working on them, or working with them, on adapting it for the municipalities to use in the future. And last but not least, we have our colleagues at Bowler who will be facilitating today, and I'll let them do their introductions as we start the day. Of course, I've, we've discussed up front that we should make this a very conversational event. So if you do have questions or comments along the way, feel free to raise your hand and shout them out for the audio. We'll repeat the questions back for the mic. And so just be aware of process there. On to Bowler. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Leslie Fanger. I'm a senior landscape architect with Bowler. And I'm here with Lindsay Corsi, who's a, a senior landscape designer. Uh, she's been helping me uh, pull together this presentation for the third and final workshop. And as David mentioned, I, I'm, this is supposed to be conversational. Um, we would love to hear from the audience. And uh, you know, we're learning a lot as we go. And there's a lot of uh, expertise in this audience, I'm sure. So uh, let's, let's have a, a nice dialogue. Um, so David explained where the, um, the, the money that funded this project came from. Um, this is a, an example of the, the final product for Concord that uh, Kim, Kim Lundgren and Bowler collaborated on. Um, it was very well received and we're adapting it to suit the needs of these three towns. So as David mentioned, we've had one workshop that focused on design of, land, of sustainable landscapes. Another workshop about uh, three weeks ago um, focused on sustainable construction practices. And this third workshop will focus on sustainable maintenance. However, what we'd like to do today is sort of do a recap of the first two so that you get the benefit of all, all three workshops in this final one. So we'll probably spend maybe 15, 20 minutes on design, 15, 20 minutes on construction, and then we'll have an intermi intermission and we'll uh, show a case study that uh, Ken Pruitt has been working at his own house uh, to create a sustainable landscape. So we have the benefit of seeing the design, construction, and the final product. So that'll be fun. Um, so Lindsay and I will kind of tag team and she's going to run through the design. So Lindsay, take it away. Thanks, Leslie. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that good? My name is Lindsay, as Leslie mentioned. I'm, I'm on her team at Bowler as a landscape designer. So basically, um, a sustainable landscape design doesn't require a lot of external input, a lot of intervention. It's self-sustaining, meaning it can keep itself surviving after you've established it, right? And that's our goal with sustainable landscape. So just some, some things to think about in terms of sustainable landscape design. We want to preserve existing native plants, right? Native plant material will thrive here because it's native here to Massachusetts. It doesn't need as much water. It doesn't need as much babying as um, some other plants that are from other regions of the world that you bring in and try to make work here. Um, invasive species, we want to remove those. 
to preserve a sustainable landscape. Because we want our native species to thrive, we don't want invasive species to choke out the natives that we already have here. So mostly native, remove invasives, those are two really big components of this. Um, and we want to use less water and energy overall. We want less resource input, right? For it to sustain itself, we shouldn't be um, needing to use or expend that many resources to keep our landscape alive. So using native plants, using less water, valuing our soil, treating these things as resources that we need to um, use sparingly and um, conserve to the best of our abilities. Energy, water, um, you know, re reducing the input of new materials as much as possible. So how we go about this, there's a design process. Um, first, you want to figure out who's doing the work. Is it you? Are, do you need to hire a contractor? Are you going to work in tandem and to what degree? A good time would, to plan all of this would be in the winter before they all book up, right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to figure out um, what your property looks like from above. You need to get a map of your property, which sounds like kind of difficult to do, but it doesn't have to be super intense. Just go on Google Earth, go on Mass Mapper, take a look at your property from top down so you can get a sense of scale and size, and then you can start to plan out the projects that you want to implement. So then you'll need to analyze your property. So identify the things that you want to remove, the things that you want to add. Um, what are your concerns? Where are there opportunities to do things? Do you have a big patch of invasive plants in the back of your yard that you really need to deal with first? What are your needs? What do you want to add? Do you want to add a pollinator garden or a rain garden? So then when you have a list of those things that you want to add and remove, you can start to lay them out on the map that you have loosely. And then just refining that, you'll come up with your design. Design is basically just the refinement of those ideas being laid out on paper. So I'll get into that a little bit. So step one, who will do the work? You or a contractor? And you need to consider who's going to be doing the design, who's going to be doing the installation, and who's going to be doing the maintenance, because it could be different people for all of those phases, right? You might be doing it all yourself, or you might be hiring a contractor just to do the, the installation and the maintenance. Maybe you do the design. Um, so it might be a combination of those things. Step two, scaled map. So these are things that you would typically want to have on a map. It's OK if you are not able to get all of them, but the more, the better. You want to know what the scale is so that you can draw things accurately to size. If you draw a bunch of circles on your plan for trees and they're not the right size at all, you're going to order too many plants or too little, and you're not going to be happy. So you need, you need the map for basically being able to plan your space accurately. You want to know existing um, things like trees, shrubs, existing plant beds. Utilities are important to know. If you have what's, what is underground, you need to know before you start digging, especially if you're doing um, a lot of digging. <laughs> so here's an example of a good scaled map. This was done by a professional. Oh, it looks kind of difficult to see up there. Um, but this was done on a computer by a professional. When you do this, it's going to look a little bit different. You're going to be going on Google Earth or Mass Mapper, some sort of GIS website probably, saving that image of your house or home from above. Um, and then you're going to be marking it up either on paper or digitally drawing over that with your scale, with your proposed trees and shrubs. And then after you get all that situated, you're going to start drawing out um, your analysis. So do you have invasive plants somewhere? Do you have a, a slope where there's a lot of ponding at the bottom and you have a big puddle that maybe that would be a good spot for a rain garden? Draw it out. You might not know the exact size yet, but just draw bubbles, like general areas of where these things are that are either concerns or opportunities. So what are your needs? What are you trying to accomplish here? What's your time span for what you're trying to accomplish? What can you reasonably expect to get done? Um, 
and you probably can't do it all all at once so you need to prioritize identify what those things are and prioritize what are your must-haves what do i need to do this year i cannot stand it if i can't get this done this season and what's negotiable what can wait until next year or maybe two years from now so then this is an example of i think that's a little bit clearer than the last image but what that might look like conceptually right just with a thick marker or anything just mark up loosely here's where i want my patio here's where i want um a pollinator garden or a rain garden and do it more than once because as you're thinking processing getting your thoughts on paper doing it more than once you might come up with a different solution the more you think about it so the first your first initial thought or your first pass might not be your final idea so spend some time thinking about it and drawing it out more than once and you might get different solutions and basically coming up with your design is just combining those solutions looking at them comparing them which one what are the best solutions from each one that i can combine on one sheet of paper into one design what are the best elements what are the best ideas that i have and how can i make them all work together so it might look something like this where you start laying out specific um, shapes for trees or shrubs to size um, you know when you come up with your final design you know when you're just doing it conceptually just some blobs are fine but you want to eventually have something that is to scale so these um, plant symbols that you see here they're the right scale so we know how much to buy how big our space is so it's important when you get to the the final stage that you are confident in that you've scaled things at least somewhat accurately so here's an example of some designs that we came up with for our first workshop i don't know if any of you were here for that our first workshop in uh stoneham we did a design workshop where we had a activity at the end and everybody worked together at tables to come up with a design for <laughs> ken pruitt's house <laughs> and i i mean i think it was difficult for people to um you know initially start to transfer their thoughts onto paper especially it's scary to be the one person holding the pen you know at your table of five or six people everyone's watching you draw but they did great and they came up with some great ideas you can see here you know this is just a loose layout but this could very well become a, a developed design with just a little bit more um, time and effort so some elements of sustainable landscape some practices that we want to impress on you conserving water and energy getting rid of invasive species using natives as much as possible reducing uh, fossil fuels so using electric equipment rather than um, gas powered decreasing erosion and stormwater runoff we want to capture water not just let it all run off into the street and into um, nearby water bodies we can use the water that collects on our site for plants or for storing in a rain barrel or something we want to support pollinators and we want to use um, pesticides as little as possible so native plants what are they they're naturally occurring in our region they thrive because they've been living here forever they're well adapted and they what's important about native plants is that they provide ecological services for pollinators and this is important because invasive plants do not do so nearly to the same extent they don't pollinators don't need invasive plants to survive they need native plants they're dependent on them so keystone plants is a basically subset of native plants where these plants are identified as the most important the most ecologically important native plants to pollinators so this list is abbreviated you have a longer um, the full list as a handout but this is just a screenshot from the handout that you have um, you can see like white oak supports 436 um, pollinator species I mean that's crazy right <laughs> pines uh, crab apples so just it's just something to keep in mind when you're looking for plants to use start here because these are the most valuable 
plants for the ecosystem that you can use. So more practices. Um, for collecting stormwater runoff, rain barrels. We'll show you later, Ken has one um, installed in his yard. So you can connect them to downspouts, collect uh, stormwater runoff, and you can use, usually there's like a spigot on a rain barrel that you can use to water plants. Um, really great way to conserve water. Rain gardens do something similar. They capture rainwater um, by being kind of like a bowl. They're shaped a little bit like a bowl so that water runs into them. And then you use a rain garden with uh, native pollinator plants, like usually perennials and shrubs, collects uh, runoff and also provides ecological services for pollinators. Cues to care. This is my favorite slide of design. So we're going to be talking about things that are typically perceived as a little bit messy, like lawn alternatives, pollinator gardens, those types of things, not the traditional um, green turf grass lawn. So just to keep in mind as we go along, cues to care are clean edges that define those messier areas. Um, so just you know, don't be too intimidated or too afraid to keep up appearances with lawn because you can use a strip of lawn or a strip of stone to provide a cue to care that says, hey, this is actually how it's supposed to look and I actually am maintaining my yard even though some of it looks a little bit messy. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Leslie for the construction review. A little bit to add on where resources are for creating your own existing conditions plan. You can go to your town website. They um, have a, a GIS um, system where you can get your property boundaries and where your house is located, where the right-of-way line is out in front. Um, so there's a lot of good information that you can just pull directly from the town website. We repeat this over and over because it's true. It's like. Um, <laughs> You, you can either get help or do it all yourself. Um, and a lot of times it's a combination of the two. Um, so if you're trying to construct something, something and it it's requires uh, heavy equipment or a backhoe or something, absolutely just go, go ahead and hire uh, a contractor to help you out. Um, our, our backs are very valuable, so we don't want to mess them up, right? Um, and then, you know, of course, if you don't feel comfortable creating your own existing conditions plan or your own um, sustainable landscape design, you can hire a company like, like Bowler, um, landscape architects, landscape designers. Um, most uh, nurseries have landscape designers on staff. You know, if it's not a real big job, you just want to um, a pollinator garden and you want some help with that, then you can work collaborative, collaboratively with a landscape designer. This is just an outline of what we're going to go over uh, in, in pretty quick order. Um, just these are the things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing a construction project. So the, the first one, you've got your design and you've pri prioritized the design based on your available budget. So kind of, you know, in the winter you say, okay, I, I really want to get uh, this part of my yard. Um, it's all invasive species. I want to rip it up. And you start planning in the winter so that if you do need a contractor, you get on their list quickly and um, be kind of first in, in the spring because we all know spring's about the best time to do any sort of planting. Um, so you, you have a budget, um, you kind of prioritize based on your design and try and start early. Um, if you're planning on doing the, the work yourself, uh, you want to make sure that you have a, a decent list and it's based on your budget. So if you're doing, um, you want to make sure you have the right tools on hand, and we have sort of a, a slide that shows what tools are, are needed for uh, construction of um, a sustainable landscape. Uh, you want a list of plant materials that you're going to need. And determine if there is, uh, like I said, heavy equipment that's necessary. Um, your, your neighbors are very good resources. A lot of times, if you're seeing they're doing work in their yard, and you like the outcome, then certainly pick their brain on who they used. Um, 
And then uh, you want to make sure that you are able to get whatever equipment into the yard. So you, ha you kind of have to plan ahead. Say your yard is surrounded by fence. You may need to take a fence section out to allow the equipment to come in. So a lot of planning involved in a construction project. This is uh, A number one, very important. You always want to know what's underground because the last thing you want to do is start digging and then hit your sewer line or your electric line. Uh, dig safe is free and it's, it's the law. So if you know that you're going to be digging in your yard, you make sure you, t you call 881 or 811 and uh, get them to come out and mark where the utilities are coming from the street. Uh, another resource that Lindsay had mentioned is Mass Mapper, um, so you can find out more information about your property. They even have topography, and it's it's pretty decent. We use it quite often on con conceptual designs and so forth. Uh, so this is the fun part when you start to implement and lay out where your garden is going to go. Um, there's several options. Um, I personally, in my own yard, use a hose to to lay out my garden bed and it's easy because you can just kind of move it around until it's got the right configuration uh, based on your design and it allows you to make adjustments in the field real time uh, wood stakes uh, spray chalk is a um, a very uh, organic and uh, user-friendly way to, to to lay out a, a landscape rope um, you can just edge it with uh, you know, a straight edge of some sort. When you start to implement your design, um, look at what is kind of in the way of what you want to do and decide whether it's worth saving or not. And if it is, then you know, figure out where you're going to put it. Dig the hole ahead of time, then dig the plant up so that it's, it's seamless and the, the plant won't even know it's been moved if you do it properly. <laughs> So I'm just going to go, I mean, you can read all this, but um, transplanting, it, it can be, if it's a larger plant, say um, you have a, a beautiful ornamental tree and it's still young enough that you can, you can move it. Um, sometimes you can start uh, earlier by just root pruning around the base of the tree. So say, say the tree is right here and you just take a shovel and just kind of start um, digging around the base of the tree, maybe two or three feet out from the, the, the trunk and start getting it used to the, the roots being cut and then leave it alone and then come back in the spring, do that again. By the time you're ready to, to move the tree, a lot of the, the shock will, will be alleviated um, by doing the root pruning earlier. Hopefully, <coughs> the soil in your yard is, is the original soil, and it should be in pretty good shape. Um, if it's a new construction, a lot of time contractors will bring soil in that isn't nearly as good as what's been there for forever. Um, a good thing to do before you start planting is to know the, the quality of your soil uh, that you have at hand. And this is a great resource, UMass Extension Service. I think it costs like $20. You take a baggie um, full of soil from various parts of your yard, and then um, you can go online and download this, this form and send it along with your, your sample, and they'll come back with a very detailed analysis of the nutrient level of your soil, the sieve analysis, which means the composition of, of um, rock and silt and clay and all of the different materials that make up a soil um, and then tell you whether you need to add organics to allow nutrients to be taken up by plants. Um, erosion control is very important. Um, as Lindsay had mentioned, you want to make sure that runoff doesn't go into surrounding uh, water bodies or even out into the street. So. When you start a uh, construction project, you want to make sure that you're, you've got some sort of a barrier, whether it's a, a lot of times you'll see road construction, and in preparation of the road construction, they've got these little, they're called little socks, basically, and they fill it with mulch. And that, that helps to 
kind of filter any of the dirty water and the, the, the silt will fall out of the water as it moves through um, the, the silt sock. Um, all sorts of different ways to retain soil. Uh, retaining walls, of course, the, the tried and true. That can be just rocks you find in your yard. There are some great products out there, um, precast concrete uh, retaining walls. They're, they're very good looking these days. Um, you can just do riprap, which is basically just taking rocks and placing them to retain the soil. And then uh, the rain gardens, we, we'll keep talking about that because it's a really nice option. Say you have a little low spot and it always is damp and moist and you just hate mowing it and it's just a nuisance. So rain garden is the perfect option for a condition like that. And then the fun part, you get to go shopping. Who doesn't like that? Um, so you want to try and see what's around. You know, try and support your, your local uh, nurseries, garden shops. Um, I try to avoid uh, big box retailers, um, even though they're clients, but <laughs> me personally. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I love uh, Mahoney's Garden Center is wonderful. Um, Russell's Garden Center is great. So, you know, try to support them as much as you can. I think one of the, the most fun things to do in your yard is to try to figure out how to reuse something that you already have. And it's, you know, just repurpose it. Um, and uh, the name for that is free cycled. So it's free if you're, if you see that someone's moving and they're having a yard sale, see if there's anything there that maybe you could use in your yard as, as part of your, your own uh, sustainable landscape. Again, you know, this free cycle concept is really taking off. Uh, we want to remove things from the waste stream as much as possible. You know, there's, there's fewer and fewer ways to get rid of our old stuff. Um, so look for creative ways to, to take what you already have and repurpose it. Or give it to your neighbor who's doing a project. Uh, put it out in the you know, front yard and say, free. Um, so things like uh, the rocks are free, plant swaps, every, every spring communities have uh, plant sales or plant swaps, your local uh, garden club is a good resource for that. Um, and then uh, my favorite mulch is just leaving leaves where they are or um, I have a kind of a, a rhododendron um, border in the back of my yard and my husband loves to take his leaf blower and blow every leaf off the lawn into that shrub border. And I used to rake it all out and I went, why am I doing that? I should just leave it there. And the rhododendrons have never been happier. It's been probably 10 years, and they're just, just growing like crazy and very happy. So um, save yourself the work and just leave the, leave the leaves uh, where they are or in a spot that's going to benefit plants that you already have in your yard. Um, some of these uh, pictures, urbanite, uh, I love that as well. You know, people are always tearing up concrete. Well. That's a great resource. If you want to do some sort of a little paved area, you can just use it as a, a paver um, or create raised uh, planter beds. So all sorts of uses for stuff that people just end up throwing out. Um, another thing that you really have to keep in mind is just arranging for the delivery. So if you're getting uh, mulch, uh, mulch is a great resource. It helps retain water. I know that people think it's probably you know, not as sustainable, but it really is. It helps add nutrients back into your, your soil. You don't have to mulch every year. Um, every other year, every two years, uh, the last thing you want to do is have mulch building up, you know, up the, past the root flare of any of the plants that you have, particularly um, trees. So as far as you know, getting mulch delivered, you want to make sure you have a, a, a tarp somewhere where you can store the mulch and ha have it not get in the way of you circulating around your, your property or accessing it for whatever uh, improvement you're going to be doing. Tree installation. Um, how many have ever planted a tree? 
Yay, that's great. Um, it's so fun and satisfying, isn't it? It's a lot of work. Um, and this diagram here is, is excellent. Um, you want to make sure that you don't plant your tree too, too low. Uh, you want to make sure that the tree, when it's done and settled, is at this slightly higher than the surrounding existing grade. The worst thing that can happen for a tree is for it to settle and have materials building up and building up. It allows um, moles and voles to go in and start eating the bark. It um, kind of strangle, strangles them. Um, doesn't allow air and water to, to get down to the root system. Um, so much better to be slightly high. Don't do any of those like volcano mulch things that you see landscapers do in office parks. Uh, very bad practice. The best time to plant is um, spring, in my mind, because it's, it's cooler, especially this year. It's been a great year for planting. It's been nice and cool. Um, and then, again, in the fall. There's all sorts of ways to get trees. You can either get them bald and burlapped, which is, which is the typical. You can get them containerized. It's the middle image. Or you can get them bare root. And bare root is a very economical way to get a tree. If you have the time and patience to allow it to, to grow, then it, I, I would recommend bare root. It's, a, it's, it's better for the tree, um, and the, the soil that you have already, it will get um, acclimated to much sooner than trying to break through the probably cl heavy clay um, root ball of a tree that may have been grown in South Carolina, all right? Another thing, look for local nurseries as well, because it'll be more adapted to the soil conditions that you probably have in your own yard. Um, so I, I won't go through this in detail. Um, all of this information is going to be included in the guidebook. Uh, so I, I see people taking notes, which is great. Uh, but it will be available in the final product that uh, will be on, every, on the town's website. So you can start looking for that sometime around December, January. OK? Yes. Yeah, um, David said that we could put this, uh, this um, presentation on, our we on the websites. Yep. Watering, definitely, I mean, that goes without saying. You have to water a, a new tree. The kind of rule of thumb that I've learned is that for every caliper inch, so let me explain what caliper inch means. Um, you see a, a tree trunk. Like say it's it's this big. The diameter um, measured from one side to the other is the caliper, and there is some debate about where you measure that. Uh, nurseries love to measure it about six inches above the root ball because it's a fatter section. Um, I would I was taught it was um, DBH, which is diameter at breast height. So, uh, but more than likely what you will get sold will be a caliper that's closer to the, the, the ball, yeah. Um, so for every caliper inch of tree, it takes about the equivalent number of years for that tree to get established in your yard. So you really do have to baby it. If you get a three inch caliper tree, which is probably you know about that big, um, it'll take about three years for it to kind of feel like it's, it's home. And um, watering's a very important part of that. Go back to rain gardens, they're pretty easy. If, even if you don't have a low spot in your yard, maybe there's a little bit of a slope, you can help retain it with um, a soil berm that kind of outlines the lower half of your rain garden. So all you need to do is dig out whatever material, whether it's uh, invasive species or lawn, then take some of that soil and just make a berm around the lower edge, and there you have it. That's, it's as simple as that. So we are going to ask our own David Pruitt to come up and uh, kind of walk you through. Um, sh yeah, sure. On watering trees, it said water mulch, not leaves. What did that mean? Uh, so you don't want to be watering the leaves on the tree. You want to you want to make sure that you direct the the stream of water 
so that it gets down to the root, root system? Good question, though. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Ken Pruitt, the Sustainability Director for the Town of Winchester, and um, happy to talk about this crazy project that we're doing at our house. It just happens to be coinciding with this workshop series. Um, but just give me one second. I'm going to see if I can adjust the screen because it's it's a little irritating here. Um, well, it's not going to be perfect, but we'll <clears throat> we'll figure it out. So, uh, so my wife and I live in Winchester. We have about a half acre property. Um, you're seeing the front the front yard there. Um, that berm you see with the trees and shrubs was put in a, a few years ago. Um, by a contractor that was doing some local mitigation for a, a huge subdivision they put in across the street from us. So that, that was pre-existing, not part of this project. Um, but you can't really see it, but this lawn, it wraps around, um, and it's so fairly extensive. So our, and, and you can see it, um, it's basically, th that's the, this whole area and this whole area is lawn. Our goals for this project were um, we wanted to kill our lawn, <clears throat> um, both because it's sort of boring, but also for to promote uh, to provide better uh, pollinator and wildlife habitat. We don't really water, but the, also less maintenance for mowing that extensive area. We we wanted to put in a pathway, a, a stone pathway from from the street to the front, because anytime anyone came to our house. Uh, even to, to deliver a package, they would walk up the driveway and walk this way, and it seemed a little ridiculous. Um, we, th this, almost the entire roof, you can see the roof is mostly on in one stretch here, all down to here, down a gutter, down spout to this spot, plus most of this vegetable garden also drains down to this point, so a lot of water uh, comes to this part of the property, and then it would just sort of erode across the front lawn. So we wanted to put in a rain garden um, that would infiltrate a lot of that storm water here. Um, and we also wanted to, uh, the other goals were to just to beautify the front of the property. And we wanted to put in a bunch of fruit trees to generate fruit. So that's, those are sort of our main goals. We knew we wanted to do this for a few years. We've been planning to do it. Um, we we knew doing it all at once would be expensive, so we budgeted about five thousand dollars for this project. Um, we didn't think that um, we didn't feel confident with a property that's uh, you know an area that's about thirty five feet by seventy feet that we could creatively come up with our own plan. So we did also decide to hire a landscape architect. Architect. So here you see some of the prep work. Um, again, if we had had a smaller area. Uh, I could have just taken out uh, a hoe or a pickaxe to remove the lawn, even though it's backbreaking, brutal, brutal work, even for an area that size. With a 35 by 70 foot area, uh, no way. Um, so we hired uh, a company to come in, a landscaping company, um, with this machine called a sod cutter. Um, it's, it, it's an amazing, almost magical machine. These guys just pushed it along. Um, and then you can roll up the grass like a carpet. They also took it away. We're talking a pretty large, very heavy quantity of, of grass with soil um, in this entire green area that they, that they removed, um, which, was, which was incredibly helpful. And they replaced it with four inches of a 50-50 soil compost mix um, to in preparation for planting, which came next. Oh yeah, so you can see this is after the lawn was removed. This is the 50-50 soil compost mix being spread. Uh, that's it being dumped and then they, you know, they sort of use this little bobcat to bring it around. So this is what it looked like after the grass was removed and the 50-50 mix was spread. Um, we also had them excavate our rain garden. We, we knew we wanted it to be it's a lot of water that comes to this point. So we, we knew it couldn't just be the six to eight inches that Leslie was talking about. Um, but we wanted, uh, you know, essentially a uh, stormwater detention basin, practically. 
We repurposed stones that we had dug up previously in other projects for the bottom of it. Um, and then we also had these uh, blue stones from left over from another project we did that we decided to use to create our front, uh, our front walkway from here to here. You'll see a picture of that in a moment. Yep, there we go. So we, uh, speaking of pickaxe, I pickaxed out this trench about uh, three and a half to four inches deep. Um, we had a bunch of crushed stone delivered from Martin Yeti's in Woburn, uh, dumped that, spread it out, and then put, oh, I had my daughter lay out the pattern ahead of time. Um, she's an engineer, so she loves this kind of thing. <laughs> so she pre-laid out an attractive um, looking layout. Once all the gravel was in, I then moved them all in and we ended up with this walkway to the, uh, to the front door. You can start to see stakes um, that were laid out by our landscape architect to delineate certain things. And so the key things are, um, we left 10 feet of lawn in the front as a cue to care, as, as Leslie was talking about. You can't quite see it here, but there's an there's a additional area that um, we're gonna, we're, we've reseeded to be a grass cue to care on the edge about four feet wide right up adjacent to the driveway. But we wanted a little bit more than that, so we, there's a, a, a pathway here that's going to be mowed, mowed grass, and then a curved pathway through here that's also going to be mowed grass. Um, and then, of course, the stone walkway. This is the rain garden. <clears throat> we also created, this, the, we have blue, we're going to put blue stones in here uh, to go from the mowed walkway to a, a, a P-stone round seating area where we have Adirondack chairs. Um, a lot of neighbors, we know a lot of our neighbors and they walk by and they come and say hi and they want to hang out a little bit and chat. Now we have a place to actually sit down and talk to them. Um, these are, uh, th these three plus these three are actually fruit trees, uh, apple, pear, and peach that we're putting in the front. Um, they're about two inch uh, caliper sized trees um, and then the rest is going to be a mix of shrubs um, and flowers and grasses for the most part um, these are these are mostly um, these are mostly shrubs that are that we're putting in and this is a mixture of shrubs and um, other plants uh, that we're that we're putting in including right right in the rain garden so we're we sort of laid stone took out certain stones and actually put plants um, so that the rain garden will have a mixture of plants and stone, um, which I, we think will be quite attractive. So there is, that's my wife planting uh, one of the plants right there. This is what it looked like. Um, well, first of all, you can see the, our landscape architect um, spray painted. It's a not, you know, biodegradable spray paint. Um, the path and had first measured out the location of the stakes. So. You know, you start with a you start with a site plan, and then it, it's to scale, um, and then you can you know stake out. Um, you, you know, you can use a hose, as Leslie was saying. You can different ways. You can sort of lay lay out what you want. Um, we then had um, our landscape architect ordered all the plants. Um, they all came and were delivered on one day, and he actually placed them all throughout the yard at, in their ultimate. Um, destinations and then one at a time we would move move the plant out of the way dig the hole put the plant back and um, and then later on we put leaf mulch I, I think there'll be a picture we, we ordered uh, eight yards of, of leaf mulch as well that we spread over the entire area except for the walkways so that they wouldn't inhibit the um, the grass growth um, for our mowed mowed pathways Let's see, anything else on this slide? I think that's it. Yep, so now you can see them. You can see everything planted. They're out of their black um, containers. They're all in the ground. We're talking about um, roughly 175 plants that we planted. We have relearned that New England soil is, feels like it's mostly rock with a little bit of soil mixed in between. Um, working as fast as I could, um, I could, it was about 10 to 15 minutes per plant 
um, for the ones that I planted. Somehow my wife went faster. I don't understand how that, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm too much of a perfectionist. Um, but that adds up to a lot. So this is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of digging and planting. And now we're, and now we're, now we're, we're watering um, initially every day. And then after the first week, we're going to, it'll be every other day. And then we'll slowly spread it out. Let's see. Oh, yep. So then you can see the rain garden basically fully installed. Can't see, you can't really make out the depth there, but it's, it's, it's fairly steep. We've, we've had to learn to be careful walking into that rain garden. It's do a little bit of a tap dance and try not to fall down. Um, it's pretty uneven. You can see the, the, the sitting area. This is a little fern garden um, that uh, we've put back here with um, cinnamon fern and Christmas fern. Um, that's, our, that's our rain barrel. I will say you see an electrical cord coming out of here. We actually put a submersible pump in here because yes, water will come out of this spigot into a hose, but under almost no pressure. And it's very hard to water things in my experience that way. So we plug in the pump um, and water comes out at much higher pressure. And we can actually use this hose uh, to spray with almost as much pressure as, as city water. So that's a little, little tip that we find very helpful. Um, and let's see, these areas are highlighted. What, why did you guys highlight these areas? What was the point you wanted me to make there? <laughs> to to um, you know, show where each of the pictures corresponds to the Oh, these correspond, right. So this, this little circle is right here. This rain garden is right here. The rain barrel is that actually the rain barrel is right here, right at the, where the downspout comes down. Um, and then, and so we have a, there's a little diverter on the downspout and you flip it open when you want to fill the barrel. And once the barrel is filled, you can flip it back up and then, and then the, the rain just goes out this downspout and right to here. So we, we, that's how we do it. And there's also a little escape hole here so that it, if it's pouring rain and this fills, the excess just pours out that, out that hole or over the top. And you can see all the rock to keep erosion from happening, um, where all this water, uh, pours down. Uh, let's see, any other comments? So, yeah, so I will say a few lessons learned. One, um, if we could redo this, we would have done certain things one year and the rest the other year. Like we've been, this has been much more time consuming <laughs> than we expected. Um, it's great, we're, we're getting stronger and have, spending a lot of time outside and breathing the fresh air and listening to the birds. That's all great, but awful lot of time doing all this work. So I probably would have done, if we could redo this, probably would have done the rain garden and, you know, maybe this uh, sit, sitting area and the walkway one year, and then maybe half the front yard the next year and the other half, either in the different season that same year or the next year. Also, um, you know, we, we went for a wide variety of plants, including fairly large trees, you know, our, our planting cost alone was about $3,500. So pretty substantial, uh, probably another 1500 for the landscape architect. Um, and then still more for the crew removing the lawn, bringing in, you know, the, the soil mixture, um, the leaf mulch that we've spread. We're, it's, it's going to be an almost $10,000 project now that we're done. And we, we did save up over a period and prepare for this but we thought it would only be 5,000 is ending up twice our budget. It is really gonna be beautiful um, and this, we're gonna love it, but a lot of work, a lot of money. And we could have, you know, in retrospect, um, you know, maybe we could have done <laughs> an area this size w one year. And then, you know, the, the, it, trying to do this entire 35 by 70 foot area all at once in one spring um, is, you know, a lot of time and effort and a lot of money all in, in one shot. So, uh, and we, I think we, we could have been a little less ambitious about just having, <laughs> right, right, yeah. So just a few, you know, words of the wise. We, we could have cut, I think, the cost of this project in half if we, you know, for, for example, had done smaller sections. We could have removed the lawn by ourselves. We could have, you know, there's a lot of things we could have done ourselves. And we could have been a little less crazy about having such a variety of plants. Um, they're all native or native cultivars. That part I wouldn't have skimped on, but um, 
it's a lot to do at once, but we're, we're delighted with the outcome so far. And within a year or two, when this is all, you know, all these spaces, people keep, they walk by and they're sort of, the neighbors are just completely baffled. Everyone stops with their mouth open. Um, and they sort of ask questions like, well, are you going to put lawn between the plants? I mean, what are you just like? It's like, no, there's going to be no lawn. All these plants are going to grow together and it's going to be a multi-level um, native pollinator friendly, you know, tree shrub, um, herbaceous, um, natural, fairly natural area. And uh, people just can't understand it. We're the, the only person in our neighborhood in this almost anywhere in town that I've seen doing anything like this. But um, uh, it's, it's intriguing to people and they, I think it's showing them that there's another way. Um, it's gonna, uh, some of our other neighbors I think are gonna be a little braver to try something out of the ordinary and hopefully they'll, they'll do it in a way that's ecologically friendly. Do you want me to cover anything else? Uh, no, anyone have Oh yeah, and then, and then questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, Charlotte. Oh yes, we we there's a little black you can't see it here, but there's we we bought um, black edging, plastic edging, landscape edging, and so we first you know dug six inches down, then we put the edging in with with stakes to keep it in place, and then pour uh, and then put landscape fab fabric down to make sure nothing grew up from that through that in the future, and then put down the pea stone. But it is still you know some of it's going to get kicked out sometimes and. Because I'm me, I'll get down my hands and knees and put put all put it all back. Once your plants have built, have moved, have moved around, you won't have a problem like that. Yeah, hopefully, once once the, the all of this area is all vegetation except for the little um, bluestone walkway, then yeah, hopefully everything will be locked in place pretty much. I saw one other hand. Yeah. Oh, yep. <laughs> Funny you should mention that. Um, <laughs> We've had the selective predation of our some of our plants from the pesky wabbits. They a lot of them hide in these um, lilies and irises. Oh, which we're gonna uh, that's one place we economize. We're gonna transplant these lilies and irises um, mostly in this area here. So that's saving us a little on on plants for that area. Um, but yes, we have quite a few rabbits. They're sort of picking out random plant. We've lost about six of our 175 plants so far. Um, they're, they're very cute, but when I see them out there eating our plants, I, I want to get a BB gun, but I have not done that. Yeah, it's an issue and, you know, we haven't put, tried to put down any smelly substance or or anything like that, um, or cages to try to keep them away yet. Um, but if they, if it gets serious, then we'd have to do something like that. And then on the back here. That, that was my same question. Oh. <laughs> that we've lost so many of our perennials to rabbits. That Tufts has a native plant site, and they have, from surveying people, come up with a list of plants that they say are less than rabbit proof, sort of. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's an issue. There's no question. And all the way in the back. I, I don't know. At, at my church, uh, the person who did have uh, perennials in a vegetable garden on our front lawn. This is a race church in Medford, and the person who maintains that was planted was clover in the grass where the and I think that has helped keep the rabbits out of the body. And so if you want the other things to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yep. In fact, the grass that we're planting in the the walkway, the pathways, is going to be mostly white clover, um, with some tall fes fescue uh, mixed in. So hopefully, the rabbits will can satiate themselves on so I don't know the clover. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Um, yes, go ahead. So you mentioned clo using some clover. So I'm curious, um, why keep grass in the design? Like, I would love to never have, <laughs> uh, we don't really have much grass, we mostly have wheat, but I would love to never have to make anything ever again. Yeah. 
So the question was why, you know, if you want to reduce mowing and planting all these native plants, why keep, why have any grass to, to mow? And it actually came up to our landscape architect asked the same question. We, he knew that we had planned to have, you know, a, a mowed path here. And he said, you know, you could just put down wood chips and, you know, it's, it'll be a pathway and you won't need to mow it. And it came down to just, um, you know, personal aesthetics. My wife and I talked about it. And she was kind of like, ah, I don't really care one way or the other. And I thought about it for a while. And I remembered some, some uh, you know, places I've visited that had, you know, wild meadow style um, areas with a little, a little mowed path. And I always thought that was just really beautiful. So it was just aesthetics. I just thought it would be beautiful. I'm not delighted that I'll have extra mowing to do, but you know it's going to be pretty pretty limited. It's one or two passes with a lawnmower on those little paths. So there's no right or wrong answer. It's just personal preference. I was just also curious whether there, maybe this is more a question. If there's any sort of low ground cover options that give you that sort of strip of green, hmm. I mean, the white clover is is kind of that, but I don't know. Ah, okay. Lawn alternatives. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, the question was about, you know, can you have an sort of an automatic watering system from your from your rain barrel, you know, Pressure is, you know, this is a low point. You could probably even put this lower, and you'd have the water pressure. So you could, you could even have drip, drip irrigation coming out of that. Um, so just, you know, even um, a garden hose and then poke a bunch of holes in it, or you could even better to get, you know, a specialized um, hose that is, and then just spread that around through the garden. And yeah, you wouldn't need to do a thing. Yeah. It does. Yep. If we, if we somehow were to, you know, we'd have to like build a shelf up here or something and lift it up. For one thing, this thing is tremendously heavy when it's full of water. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's hard to, you know, you see places where the drinking water barrels are on the roof of buildings the same idea that you know the higher you get it the the more pressure um, but it's just kind of logistically difficult and I uh, you know a lot of crap comes off the roof onto this thing I have to there's a there's a screen underneath this cap um, and I need to shake out the screen fairly often because it's you know um, leaves and I mean small small leaves pine needles and um, uh, a little little stone dust from the asphalt shingles comes down the downspout and starts to clog things up. That's the other thing I'd worry be worried a little bit about with like drip irrigation is that you know some of that stuff would make it and then start clogging up the drip irrigation. I'm not sure. Um, anything else? Yeah, go ahead. So do you, do you water by hand with a hose? And how much time? Oh, thank you. I meant to cover that. Thank you. So yeah, so this again, you know. This, this is a big this is a big area um, and you know initially we watered all 175 plants by hand we we're just standing there with the hose plant number one <laughs> plant number two and it was very time consuming but it was it was kind of satisfying you know after all that work it's like you know just just you know uh, I, for whatever reason it was weirdly satisfying and now the satisfaction is worn off. And um, <laughs> so we have one of those big oscillating sprinklers now um, that we've hooked up. And we put it on for about an hour, once a day at this point. And it, it, we put it right here. And it covers this, this zone. And then f this zone we're doing by hand still. Um, because it's there's not an ideal place to move the sprinkler for that second zone. We don't want to waste a bunch of water, so that's sped up our process by more than half um, just by using that sprinkler. And I know not everyone's just, just concerned about 
watering the leaves and it could create fungus or something and I'm just not worrying about that we're just I think it's fine <laughs> and if that's it I'll pass it back to our main presenters I'm gonna do an interjection in our little interlude here so uh, on the opposite side of Ken's very planned, very uh, very well-designed uh, improvements at his home, I'm a renter. I live in the Heights in a three-family building. I've got probably, I don't know, let's say 300 square feet in my backyard. And I've done what I can do too. So if you're looking to start very, very small and you're willing to take a bit of chance, then I can offer a bit of guidance in that regard. I, I went with seed because buying plants was far more expensive and I was able to procure first a wildflower mix and then I went with some straight native species that I got from, I think, American Meadows and then maybe a couple of other sources. And this ran me maybe 50 bucks, all told. So I just ripped out some grass, ripped out the invasives, spread the seed, and let it go. And so far, so good. We've been subject to a lot of rabbit and squirrel intervention, but we, <laughs> uh, you know, if your garden's not feeding something, it's not part of the ecosystem, so we're, we're happy to just let it go. And the things that they're not eating have come in and done very well. So if you look to do something very, very small and um, just have a uh, have less space to work with, then you could go that route and do a very minor intervention that might flourish. Um, another separate interjection here. If you're enjoying spending time in this room, you might want to come back this evening because we're having the MBTA communities conversation in this room. Uh, I believe it's seven tonight. I'll double check while I'm talking. But this is the present 730. Uh, this is the presentation of the multifamily district um, and we'll have a lot of feedback. Of course, there's been input along the way. And this is the MBTA community's working group sharing the results of that feedback and displaying a map of where there's a proposed district or districts for the MBTA community's project. So there are many environmental issues to discuss in that forum, stormwater, ecological integrity, and uh, habitat preservation, tree canopy, etc. I mean, there are many things we want to touch on, so I hope that you'll be able to join that conversation and contribute to it. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to enhance the kinds of things that we're discussing today in larger developments or just multifamily developments that are still on you know small scale. So um, please do attend. It'd be great to see you there. I'll hand it back over to the crew. Sorry, go ahead. I have a quick question yeah. Rid of grass. Oh, sure. I went with just my hands because I have a small space and it worked fine. It was already not in great shape. I neglected to mention that our landlord leaves the landscaping to tenants, which is a way of passing the buck, but he got really lucky finding me because I was like, let's do it. And <laughs> um, it obviously was not well maintained to start. So I just, you know, took out what was mostly dead, mostly invasives, and uh, replaced it. But I'm sure maybe when we talk about lawn alternatives, we can talk about replacement strategies. Just touch on it. Right. Thank you, David and Ken. That was uh, a great case study, um, big and small. So uh, I think it was well worth the, the break in, in the presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to um, sustainable landscape maintenance. Again, uh, who's going to do the work? Uh, there are a lot of landscape contractors out there that are trained in sustainable um, maintenance practices. Um, so, you know, do some research and try and find them. Um, they're out there. So, maintenance, you know, 
start planning in the winter as usual um, with anything. If you want um, a contractor to assist with any of the, the work, you want to get them on board early so that you're, you're first on the list. Um, so there's you know sort of a, a regular list of things to be done throughout the year. And we're structuring the presentation based on the seasons. Um, starting in the spring, we have this list of, of things that can be um, accomplished, summer, and then fall. And All right, so spring. Um, integrated pest management is sort of a, a, a buzzword, but it's, it's, it's a, a great method where you basically um, treat the issue rather than you know, wholesale spray for bugs. If you have a problem, um, deal with it. And try to deal with it in a, a more sustainable approach. So first off, you need to figure out you know, what, what is the species that you're trying to deal with. Is it a bug or, or a plant? Um, there are lots of websites that, that you can go to to help um, identify what, what the plant or insect, lots of apps out there. I just found a great one. It's called Merlin, and I, I just hold it up, and it listens to bird song, and it tells me all the birds that I'm listening to. It's fantastic. So um, there's lots of apps that can help identify whatever it is you want to figure out. Um, you know, IPM, integrated pest management, means knowing the species you are attempting to control and targeting that species. You don't want to... Um, treat for ants and kill the bees. You know, that's the whole philosophy. Um, planting early, using um, resistant plants, reducing plant stress. Uh, you want to monitor, kind of go, see how everything's doing. Um, one of my favorite parts of the year is the spring be because I go around and see who's made it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, good. You're okay. And then, you know, turn a leaf over and see if there are any um, aphids or what have you that may, may have taken um, up residence. Um, and then if you want to intervene, then try to do it in a, uh, a biological way. You, there are uh, bug species that you can bring in. Um, what's a good one? Uh, Ladybugs, for sure, yep. Um, and so you can get a list uh, online of some of the beneficial species that can help deal with pests. Uh, sometimes it's just they're overrun and you really do have to intervene with um, some sort of natural solution. Um, or you can go and just, if you have um, grubs, there's milky spore, which is a very effective um, treatment. It's, it's a little persnickety to, to use, but um, ba basically you take milky spore and in a grid of every foot or two, you put a, t a tablespoon on the ground. And you do that all through your, your yard, and it'll last for up to 25 years. And it's just a biological control that's um, fairly inexpensive and uh, really does work for grubs, which can be a real pest. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, you know, have a yard where birds want to live, and they'll help take care of pests better than anything. Um, so bird feeders, uh, this is uh, a great list of, of beneficial insects. Um, again, you can see this whole presentation online if you're interested. Um, uh, all sorts of spices. Uh, I had a problem with um, moles, so the plants I planted, I added a, a tablespoon of cayenne pepper to the soil. And it seems to have worked, because uh, the plants made it without getting the roots eaten off. Um, plants can, can be a natural deterrent something that has some fragrance, um, mint, lavender, basil, uh, lemongrass, which was news to me. I, I love growing it. It's beautiful, almost ornamental plant, and then you get to use it in, in different recipes once, once it gets big enough. 
natural solutions. Um, so boric acid is one. You can take your um, dish soap, mix it with water, and put it in a spray bottle. And, and that will help as well. Depends on what the bug is. And, but that's, that's been effective, uh, sometimes very easy, available. Vinegar, same thing. Uh, lots of natural solutions. Um, there are some invasive worms that um, don't like diatomaceous earth. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, but if you end up getting that invasive worm, that can help. Um, eradicate it. Best way to do it is pick the bugs off if you see them and put them in a cup, of, like say you have slugs, a um, cup of beer. It's really kind of gross, but it works. <laughs> um, and you know, mulch we talked about earlier, you can um, do a thick layer of mulch and it will help keep the weeds down. Uh, I think someone asked about uh, getting rid of some lawn. One way you can do it is to almost pasteurize um, the lawn. You put black pa plastic down. It'll superheat the lawn, kill the roots, and makes it easier to dig up over time. That also can work for um, insect control, that if you have something in your soil. Uh, a lot of times people will leave uh, tulips to kind of naturally just die back, um, but that can also introduce a, a fungus into the soil. So if you're trying to naturally eradicate the fungus, um, you can also uh, try the solar method. Um, going out and picking weeds, picking off bugs works as well. Um, you see the deer fence there. So I have a garden, and I put a four-foot fence up thinking that would keep them out. <laughs> Not high enough. <laughs> so... That's, you, you have to be strategic. Um, deer, if you do have a problem, I'm, I'm out in the country, so I, I do have a, a fairly large deer population. They are creatures of habit, and I think maybe rabbits are as well. If they can get a, a, a meal, they'll go, keep going back to the same spot. Um, so I recently, last year I lost my entire hosta garden. It got mowed down. They all came back, but not as strong, so I took a deer fencing and just laid it over the top of it. And you really don't see it. It's just a very light black um, mesh, and so far it's working. Um, again, I, I encourage people, if you have your own solutions that have worked for you, raise your hand and, and speak up. I know we have some experts in the, in the audience, so feel free to, to offer up uh, some solutions that you've had. One of the uh, biggest problems that Massachusetts is facing is invasive plants. Um, I think you also, as a handout, um, we gave the invasive species list last time, okay. It will be included in uh, all of the presentations, the, the previous pe presentation, but it will be included in the um, guidebook. So it's a list of invasive species. You can go online, see, see what they look like, uh, I know oriental bittersweet is a very common one, Japanese knotweed, really hard to get rid of. Um, you know, with Japanese knotweed, you almost have to get a backhoe to take the stuff out. It's tenacious. And, but, and then you have to like monitor it. If there's even a, a little root left in soil, it'll, it'll continue to grow and come back. So monitoring is very important. Um, I think uh, we mentioned earlier there's lots of great apps. Picture This is a great one, and PlantNet is another one. Um, so you can, if you're taking a walk in the woods and you want to know what the plant is, you know, you want to assume it's a native, and you can just uh, take a picture of it, and um, Picture This will tell you what it is. Yes, ma'am. I did not know that. Thank you. It's awesome. So is that just the latest version, or has it been in? Yeah? It's been in for quite some time. Oh, wow. Okay, I'll have to look. Thank you. Um, you know, we don't want to use chemicals, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, so the first 
option would be just to try and like take a shovel and dig it out and you know burn it or put it in a, a bag and put it in the trash and off it goes. Um, you can cut cut back anything that uh, looks like it's uh, getting out of control if it's an invasive uh, plant. Sometimes if you cut it enough, it'll just die, which is ideal. Um, if you do need herbicides, uh, a lot of times you can just maybe cut, say it's a oriental bittersweet. Uh, I've seen the, the, the roots that, um, not roots, but the vine going up and they get very thick. You cut a section out of it and paint it with an herbicide. And then the herbicide doesn't, rather than spraying for it, it will get down into the root system and kill it in the root system. Um, so that's a very effective way. Uh, poison ivy, same thing. It's not an invasive, but um, you know, a lot of people are allergic to it and don't want it in their yard. So that's a, an effective means of, of reducing it. Um, this last point is a really good one. Once you remove the invasive species, you really should plant something in its place so it doesn't get reestablished. And that, that plant should be a native. I know we, we talk a lot about planting natives or native cultivars or adapted plants. Um, you know, there are so many beautiful plants that we all love and cherish that are not native. We're not suggesting that you can't plant those. But maybe, you know, the percentage could be higher, you know, 70% natives and maybe 30% are beloved uh, flowering plants from another country. So we're not, we're not trying to, to shame people that have beautiful flowering plants that aren't native. Uh, weeding and pruning. I had meant to bring <laughs> a, a twig to show people how to do proper pruning, um, and I forgot, I apologize. But um, you, with, um, with the springtime, uh, a lot of people are talking about no mow may, and I thought that was intriguing. Um, and the reason for that is that are, there are a lot of um, butterflies and moths that are still in their cocoons and they're like snuggled into the, the leaf matter that is in your yard or uh, on your trees and, and shrubs. And you wanna give them a chance to, to come out. And um, if you clean up too early in the season, sometimes you, dis you disturb them and they, they don't have a chance. So um, I tend to wait until you know mid to late May uh, before I start doing my, my spring cleanup. Uh, with pruning, you want to, you know, maintain the shape and the size. There's different techniques and tools that you can use for pruning, um, and we'll have a kind of a, a list of those coming up. Uh, deadheading, it just helps the plant look better um, and helps the plant fill out more. Um, I think the best way to get rid of weeds is to go and just pull them out as you're walking around with your morning coffee or your glass of wine in the afternoon and just <laughs> keep a little bucket somewhere and just when it's full then you go dump it. Um, dump it in your compost pile. Uh, it's Compost is about the, the cheapest form of, um, form of fertilizer that you can get. Um, this one is uh, steaming. I. I didn't know about this one either, David. You were, <laughs> he had mentioned he hadn't known that, but during, during our research, um, there are tools out there that can help remove weeds and kill them, one of which is a, a steaming um, tool. And lots of different tools have been developed that help remove weeds from cracks and, and between patio pavers and that sort of thing. Vinegar also works, just a little, a little smelly. Uh, edible weeds, I think, you know, mint is a favorite. Uh, a lot of people eat the uh, dandelion leaves. Um, so not all weeds are bad. Um, and then composting, just uh, all sorts of options. Um, you know, take your kitchen waste, put it in a little bin underneath your, your um, sink, and then bring it out to the compost bin when it's full and it's the best nutrients that you can get for your garden. Um, after it decomposes, you spread it in the lawn, you can spread it in your vegetable garden, um, and, and in your perennials and so forth. So composting is, 
is probably the most sustainable thing that you can do. You're taking that material um, from your kitchen out of the waste stream and, and helping um, your neighbors in, in town deal with um, an overload of, of stuff in their dump. And, and um, again, you know, top dressing your, your lawn with compost, uh, very good practice. Helps put nutrients back into the soil. And then uh, this is a handy little tool that uh, Lindsay came up with for calculating how much mulch you really need. So it's sort of a, a depth by uh, square foot area. And then all sorts of different mulch as well. It doesn't have to be the typical bark mulch that we see everywhere. Um, pine needle straw, I have lots of pine needles in my yard. That's what I used on my perennials last year. This year, I, you know, they decompose a little bit. Um, and this year I used natural bark mulch. So um, leaf mulch, again, just leave it in a shrub border and uh, it'll decompose, add nutrients back into the soil. Ground cover is another one. Um, all sorts of uh, really nice ground covers that are aesthetically pleasing and el also keep weeds down. Um, grass clippings, that works as well. It's not my favorite because <laughs> you have to mow and, and collect them and rake it all up. Um, but All right, I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay to talk about summer. So I'm going to start out talking about the typical um, turf grass lawn we're all familiar with, and then we're going to get into some lawn alternatives that you might want to try out. Um, so first, to, to cover the traditional lawn, you never want to mow more than a third of the length of the blade of grass in a single mowing. Um, mowing really far down, setting your blade really low, um, could cause some stress to the lawn and cause it to be more susceptible to damage and disease. Um, and for the same reason, you want to keep make sure that your mower blades are sharp, something you can do in the winter while you're waiting around for spring and summer. Make sure they're sharp so that you get a clean cut, just for the same reason, um, to keep your lawn healthy and keep it from being susceptible to problems. Um, this little handy picture in the lower right corner, you should try to mow in different directions each time you mow. It just promotes healthier, stronger grass. Um, no reason not to, it might be more interesting when you're going back and forth and back and forth. Switch the direction next time. Okay, now I'm gonna get on my soapbox. So, kill your lawn. We're all familiar, I mean, th this is a culture, right? We are expected to keep up appearances by having a nice, crisp, green lawn with nothing in it but lawn. Maybe because you are all here, you don't necessarily subscribe to that idea as much as the typical American. My own father, I, I can't convert to uh, lawn alternatives just yet because he's, it's such a sense of pride for people, right, to maintain and say, look at, look at the, it's almost a competition, like who has a greener lawn, whose lawn is better. I know <laughs> people think of it as a competition in my neighborhood. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a, mindset shift, right? Like, you know, converting to lawn alternatives is by no means the norm, um, but maybe it could be. And like Ken said earlier, you know, maybe people in his neighborhood will be braver now to try different things because he's done it successfully and they'll start to see it grow in and become beautiful. So, you know, something to consider. The traditional lawn wastes water. It really doesn't do much for biodiversity pollutes water bodies with all the fertilizers that we put into it to keep it alive and as green as possible. It's just not super beneficial to our environment. So I wanted to bring up something that the town of Concord's doing. Um, somebody told me about this in the last workshop actually, that Concord has three different demonstration lawns throughout town. So the locations are Junction Park, West Concord, and then CCHS. Oh, and, and the main library, I'm sorry. So three different places where they have three different lawn alternatives. One of them is Pennsylvania Sedge. Then they have Rupture Wart slash Green Carpet in another area, and then Micro Clover for the other location. 
so I took these pictures right off their website, so you can go check it out if you want. Um, on Conquer's website, they have more information about all of this, but, you know, maybe you could go swing by next time you're in the area, scope it out, see which one speaks to you, if any at all. And so I'm going to go through some examples of um, alternatives to the traditional lawn. This is not an exhaustive list. You can get creative and I encourage you to do research because there are a lot of alternatives out there and they're, a lot of them are kind of different from each other. So, you know, you might need to do some research to find out which one is best suited for your needs. White clover, we're going to start there. Um, I think someone in the back mentioned um, that they have white clover and it kind of attracts rabbits and almost like is like a diversion plant, like from things that you don't want rabbits to eat. I think that's such a good point because someone else said like, if your plants aren't getting eaten, they're not part of the ecosystem. So why not add things that are part of the ecosystem and then maybe plants that you don't want to get eaten will, you know, pressure will be taken off of them a little bit. If you add more things like clover. Another one's moss. Um, that's a little bit different in color and texture from clover, as you can see. Um, more, I think it looks more beautiful in like shaded areas for sure. Easier to do there. Look how beautiful it looks among like steps. I have a, a hillside in my yard where we have terraced like bluestone steps and moss growing on either side. And it's just so, it's just so beautiful. It does great in shade, requires no maintenance, no mowing. Another one, wild strawberry. These get, these plants get a little bit taller than white clover and moss. Um, it's more of like a ground cover type, but of course, certainly you can use ground cover anywhere you want. It just might not be as low and uh, like, like, might not have as much like, likeness to lawn as you might like. It's more of a ground cover type plant. Creeping thyme is also beautiful. Beautiful pink flowers. And it's a nice green when it's not in bloom. This is a lower one, um, but you know, also resembles more of a ground cover than lawn. I put these two on the same side because of the texture being kind of similar where it's not as smooth looking as maybe like moss or white clover might be, but just still a great alternative if you're open to it. Now we have Pearl's Premium and Lomo Fescue. These are more similar to each other because they are more grass-like. Pearl's Premium is a grass seed. Um, it's just a specific seed that requires less water and less fertilization than the uh, typical seed that you would get. Lomo Fescue. It's called Lomo because you don't have to mow it very often. And I think this one looks so beautiful because it's so swishy and looks so like just a nice beautiful like, meadow look. It's so unique, but it still looks like a lawn enough where you maybe wouldn't be as nervous to try it because your neighbors aren't going to walk by and go, oh my God, what did you do? What is this? Like, are you going to put grass seed in between these plants? You know, it still looks like grass. Yeah, th the comment was about Pennsylvania sedge and how it, it looks similar to low mo fescue when it gets grown in. Um, so definitely, if you're in the Concord area, go check that out at some point. Um, Cause I don't know when they installed those demonstration lawns a couple years ago. So it's probably pretty, pretty filled in by now and, and might look pretty lush like these images here. Thank you for that. Um, so I just also want to say, you know, weeds, we think of weeds as bad, but you know, some of them are edible. A lot of them aren't invasive. Traditionally, we're kind of expected to eradicate all of the weeds within our lawn. I had a professor once that told me that he thinks a lawn full of, or a field full of dandelions is way more interesting to look at than a vast green expanse of nothingness. So, you know, it's a cultural thing. It's something that, you know, most people might not agree with, but um, it's a shift that kind of needs to happen. So. Just something to think about. Maybe it's better to have something that's more interesting to look at and more supportive of local wildlife than something that's desolate. 
So if you have an area of lawn that's burnt or dying or just not doing well, why not just turn it into a, a alternative that's going to function and you're not going to have to maintain or try as hard to keep alive. And to maintain um, your lawn alternatives or your landscape, I also want to say just if you can, switching to electric is a good idea if you're committed to sustainability, not using gas-powered equipment, leaf blowers, lawn mowers, weed whackers, chainsaws, hedge trimmers. Um, something I also want to say about uh, leaf blowers in particular, be gentle if you can, or if you can avoid using them at all, that's great. Just for the, the fact of when you're blowing everything around, you might also be blowing around insects and pollinators who don't need to be disturbed. So you're blowing leaves around, but you're also blowing other things around um, that you're not trying to. So just be mindful, be careful of that. So manual equipment that you can use. This is not an exhaustive list, but just things that you probably will need if you're going to be doing um, a landscape project by yourself in your yard. Loppers, shears, hand pruners. You might not know the difference between some of those, that's fine. Um, wheelbarrow push spreader for seed. Cultivator to break up your soil and break up your mulch. Hose, push mower. Um, rakes for different purposes. You know, like a plastic flimsy rake like this might be fine for um, leaves, but if you're trying to prep your garden bed for vegetables or, you know, do some kind of serious cultivation work or pushing around, you might need a metal rake to spread and smooth things out. Plastic rake might not cut it, so um, hand trowel, gloves, obviously, please wear gloves, especially if you have poison ivy in your yard or roses or barberry. And I'm going to hand this back over to Leslie for fall. I think I've already mentioned this before. If you can, just leave your mulches where, where they fall, or your leaves where they fall, and they will become, they'll break down and become nice uh, mulch for your, for your shrubs um, and provide you know, hiding place and, and also protect the roots um, of your shrubs from deep frost. Um, so it's a great, great alternative to going and buying mulch. Just use your leaves. Um, these are some ideas for how to get your mulch or your, your leaves to break down quicker. You can just run over it with your mower and break it all up um, or just put it in a compost pile. I've been at my house for about 19 years and I have a mulch pile, or not a mulch pile, but a compost pile that's probably as big as that screen. And I use it every year um, to, to plant new plants, supplement my vegetable garden with, with nice uh, nutrient rich soil. Um, fall cleanup. Um, just use soft materials under your trees. Uh, don't build up against the root flare any higher than the root flare. So here's the, here's the tree trunk. It's coming up like this. That's the root flare. You don't want any material against the root flare. So things that you can start today, you can start to research um, any of the ways that you want to maintain uh, in a more sustainable manner. Um, this book here is a great guide for sustainable landscape construction. It also talks about how to maintain it. Um, it's, it's like a Bible to sustainability. Great, great resource. Um, don't use Roundup if you can help it. Uh, it stays in our soils for generations. Um, really doesn't even break down at all. Uh, can enter into the, the water system and if you have a well, I don't, maybe, um, not in these urban areas, but you want to make sure you reduce the amount of Roundup. Um, switch to electric and manual tools, as Lindsay was talking about. Um, there's just every year the list of available electric or battery operated tools grows and grows. And, you know, 10 years ago we really didn't have that option. Hi, Brucey.
Good tip. Everyone heard that? Yeah? Good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, you know, one na you know, th one mower between five neighbors, a very uh, economical way to to get what you need. You know, share your tools, make sure you bring them back to whoever bought it. <laughs> That's usually the challenge. <laughs> um, but um, you know. Again, things you can start today that are really easy and sustainable. Um, you know, start a compost bin. That's so easy. It's it's. Um, I know kitchen waste can get a little smelly, but there are all sorts of like charcoal bins that you can get. Um, you know, at at the store that will help reduce the the smell of the kitchen waste. So, um, you know, again. Lindsay did a great job of, of sharing some alter lawn alternatives. Um, there are lots of pros out there. I know we have a, uh, two or three in the audience, including, um, or besides just Lindsay and I. Um, talk to your neighbors, see who they've used, and you know, try them out. Um, kill your lawn. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm there yet, but go ahead. Fantastic. Yeah. So in terms of building the community, it's, yeah. it's a very natural way to do it. Excellent. That's lasagna. Uh, yeah, I love it. So so super easy. And it used to be like rock hard, perpetually dying grass, and now my favorite hand tool is a pony pony knife, dig dig knife, you know, serrated. Oh yeah. Great tip, thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Rubbing alcohol. Good one. Wow. Okay. Excellent. I I think um, you had a question, and then I'll take yours. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay.
it'd be great if we could enhance the tree um, section, if you will. Okay. On, on the handbook. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. We would love to hear from you. So, um, if you have, are you on um, the town's like committees and you? Okay. All right. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. When we were driving in into Arlington today, you know, Lindsay's like, "I've never been here." I said, "Yeah, it's been a while for me." I'm like, "It's very leafy," <laughs> and it is. So you're you're doing a great job. Yeah, well done. Um, let's see. I think I'm um, take her first, and then yeah. So clover as, as a transitional plant. I just want to make sure that people can, uh, it, yep, it adds nitrogen back into the soil and can be a, a lawn alternative or uh, just a, a cover crop for temporary. Yeah. So thank you very much. That's, that's a great comment. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Very good point, and that's that's definitely be added to this list. Um, dark sky compliant. A lot of communities are. That's a regulation now, so it's it's good we're heading in that direction. Um, but there's probably more that we can all do as property owners to reduce the amount of light, you know, spilling out into our yards uh, at night. So thank you. Um, so I think that is uh, just a just a recap. Start small. Um, don't overwhelm yourself. Know what you can handle and what your capabilities are. Um, take uh, lessons learned from Ken and his experience. I thought that was great. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of opportunities at your own property. Share what you know with your neighbors. Try to spread the word. Um, and ton of resources out there. It's just endless. That's that's a good thing about the internet, right? Um, and try not to be too intimidated. Um, start drawing your your yard and it'll give you confidence if you come up with a plan to actually go out and start to um, put into practice some of the things that you've drawn. Um, you know, lots of professionals available, so uh, reach out if you need to. And um, buy a little more material than you need because you always think that you have enough and then you end up going back to the, the nursery because you didn't get as much as you needed. Um, and try to look around your properties, your neighbor's properties. Uh, if they're throwing something out that you can use, go ahead, be creative. Um, and that concludes our workshop series. So thank you all. Thank you everyone for coming. This has been a really lively discussion. I appreciate all the expertise and interest that you have in the topic. Um, wanted to mention that there were other folks who I didn't mention in the intro who informed this process. We had a steering committee, Gene Wildman, Jeremy Marin, uh, Brucey e. Moulton, and uh, Jennifer Tidwell. I think that was the person that I neglected to mention. Um, so they were excellent, and as all things we try to do in the planning department, we have residents participating in the effort to bring this to fruition. So. Thank you to them and thank you to all of you. I wanted to remind folks too that there is the Spring Fest up in the Heights on Saturday and there's gonna be a bunch of uh, environmental tables there for you know community groups. Also uh, our Conservation Commission, Open Space Committee and others are all gonna have tables there. So opportunity to get plugged in to town goings on and meet like-minded folks this Saturday. It's in the afternoon, two to five, I believe. So again, thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to see you here.